Okay. Are we going to be like talking about our papers in class with everybody in class? Yes. So, so where do we, do we send our paper? Are we going to like post it on the discussion boards for everybody no. to see? You send me your paper early um, because I'm giving, I'm giving people the choice in your class. Um, but I'm guessing you're going to be participating in the live class here. So send it to me early and I'll forward it out to class to read that day. So shoot it to me in an email. Can I send it to you anytime? Of course. Yeah. That if you send it that day, maybe send it about 12 or so, just so just to give every, get every the class time to read it. Um, and that goes for all of you. And that day, um, if you participate in a live peer review, submit it, send me an email around 12 so that I can forward your paper to the rest of the class. Okay. So I don't have to wait till next week. I can send it this week. Yeah, if you can submit it early, then I can forward your paper to the to the class. So okay. I forget what I said about peer review in our online class. Um, I know I gave everybody the option to participate. Yeah, that's what I did. I gave everybody the option to participate in this one, get some extra credit. That's what I did, right? So you will get some extra credit, Kira, for, for participating. Doing peer review on discussion forums is uh, kind of a, uh, yeah, it's kind of a lost cause. People just say that's the best thing I've ever read in my life. You should you should win the Pulitzer for this paper. Right? That, that's what people tell it. <laughs> that's what people tell each other on the discussion forums. So that's what hence the fact that we're doing it live. Okay. Yeah, Lauren's smiling. She knows I'm right. She knows I'm right. So I wish there was a better way to do it, peer review, you know, just on the discussion forum, but there's not. People just conflate each other's egos. Nobody's, everybody's always worried about offending somebody, right? You guys need to take a lesson from me. I'm not afraid to offend anybody. Hey, no, I wasn't afraid of that in 101. You were the only sign of intelligent life in 101, if I if I recall, Nicole. Careful now, Dr. Yeager. My head's went too big. I won't even be able to fit through the doors in my house. And Ryan was the only sign of intelligent life in my other 101 last last time, if I recall too. Only if it was hell, you could do a, or what is it? Uh, go on, Ron. I was the only one who ever said anything in the class. Yeah. Thank God I'll never have to teach 101 on Zoom again, hopefully. All right, so quick review of writing the paper. Microsoft Word. You know that Times New Roman 12 is always the font. You know this. You know this. Be a little larger for the purposes of today. So the intro. Remember that in a good paper, you have an attention grabber. Um, maybe a quote interesting fact or statistic um, an anecdote etc so this is the same advice i gave everybody in english 101 for doing an attention grabber that you want to you want to do anything other than say in mary shelley's frankenstein she wrote about nature versus nurture right you want you, you want to avoid that type of boring intro, that boring sort of opening hook. Um, as far as this goes, I always tell people, write the boring opening hook first, just to get you started. 
then later, like when you're in the polishing stage, you can go then go back and have the attention grabber. That's what I tend to do. Sometimes, sometimes you might sit there for an hour and think about what your attention grabber is going to be when you can have actually got started on the on the analysis. So that's all. That's a, perhaps a decent piece of advice. Get right your attention grabber last. But then, of course, uh, introduce your texts. Provide your inter your thesis. Remember, the thesis usually takes takes this type of model. You can do this over a couple of sentences. It doesn't have to be one gigantic sentence. All right. So, reason one. Oops. No. While some argue blank, I argue blank because reason one, reason two, reason three. If you state your reasons up front, then you can then organize the rest of the paper accordingly to fit those reasons. All right, so. That's, that's your thesis. You gotta have a good thesis. Otherwise the thing will fall apart on you. Oftentimes, if you don't have a good thesis, people tend to summarize um, more than analyze the text. Part two is your literature review. Your literature review. Now this, this should be more evident to some of you guys now that you've done the bibliography or are working on it. I mean, now that you now that you're at this stage. So in the literature review section, hold on one second, guys. Oh, never mind, never mind. I thought I was getting on a call. Pause the recording real quick. You're muted. You're muted. You unmuted and muted yourself again. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I'm just blowing smoke. The Zoom knows how much smoke I'm blowing. The point Zoom mutes me. I blame it on Zoom. But in the lit review, sum up the patterns in the scholarship. Then show how you're responding to the larger conversation. So the literature review, remember, is a good place to um, get your source, especially like cite your sources. The literature review can be a couple of paragraphs if, if you want it to be. Um, it can be a couple paragraphs. Sum up the patterns you're noticing. So like, for instance, like Nicole, right? Sum up what people are saying about Paradise Lost and Frankenstein. Like what are the what are the trends that you're noticing in the conversation? I, know, I, know, I noticed from reading both Lauren and Nicole's bibliography, I noticed both of you guys um, are noticing some of these patterns after reading a couple of the art, several of these articles. So um, show how you're responding to the, to the larger conversation. It's worth taking a pause here to Remember how we cite stuff in the text. You guys, we've already gone over how to cite stuff on the work cited page. Worth having a quick reminder on how to cite stuff in the text. 
So uh, in the literature review, I actually give people different advice than I tend to give normally. In the liter so if you're not clear in the sentence who the author is, that's when you have to put the author's name in the parentheses and then the page number from the PDF. So if you're reading these research articles from EBSCO and stuff, you probably have a page number where you found that quote or whatever. So if you use a colon to introduce the quote, you don't have to put a comma before the quote would you still need to insert a comma between the last quote and the parentheses or take out the comma and just put the parentheses like you have it here? I'm not sure, say, say that again, Nicole, what about a comma? So uh, if we use a colon to introduce the quote, then we don't have to use a comma. Um, do we still need to put a comma between the end of the quote and the beginning of the citation? No. Okay. No. It took me a minute to grasp what you were asking me, but I would always recommend using a colon to introduce a quote. It's better style than a comma. Technically, you could put a comma here, but uh, it's not, the style is, it's just better style to use a colon when you introduce a quote. Uh, it's just one of those things that I can't really give you a logical reason why. It's just more highly looked upon to use comma, colons to introduce quotes rather than commas. And you do not have to put a comma here in between the author the page number either so you don't have to put like shelly comma 35 you don't you don't have to do that just put shelly 35 so you don't have to put the comma in the in-text citation um, i think you do an apa but that's just because those apa people were a bunch of losers all right so that's why they put commas in between like we mla people realize you don't have to do that all right so Listen, listen to my ad hominem fallacies here, throwing, throwing shade at the uh, APA people. Honestly, didn't know you didn't have to do that because my 101 teacher told us last year that we had to do that. Did you use more APA or MLA in that class? MLA. Well, the teacher was wrong. <laughs> you don't. You don't have to. You don't have to put a comma in between. In between the two, that's not an MLA. I'm up. They might have. Depends how old your teacher was. You might. They used to do that, but the new rules. You don't have to. Okay. So is that for SAT and SAT and Do we have to put that in like a literary? review thing for like our scholars or is that for our paper like citing the book so in the literature review section you're summing up the scholars right so i'm just showing you how to cite just a site review in general but you're, you are going to be citing some of your scholars here so like maybe you know maybe as you're just talking about trends Right, you can then put the author's name in the parentheses as you're talking about the trends you're noticing. So if you're if you're paraphrasing or you're taking a direct quote from one of these articles, you uh, this is how you write them out. This is how you cite inside the text. You'll also do this later, of course, when you cite from whatever book it is you're uh, you're talking about right you, you'll have textual evidence later in the paper too so um but i'm just saying here that the literature review is a good place to get that scholarship out of the way just to show hey i'm responding to a larger 
conversation here. Let's say that um, from the context of the sentence, uh, I just, if, if, you, if the author's name is clear from the context of the sentence, you then do not have to put the author's name in the parentheses, right? So you do not have to put the author's name in the parentheses if it's clear from the context who it is you're quoting from. Um, you know, lots of times, that's something I'll notice, students sometimes are a little over careful, then they'll say it in a sentence and they'll say it in the parentheses. No, don't, don't do that. You only have to say it in, if you say it in the sentence, it doesn't have to go in the parentheses. You must have really hated uh, reading my first short paper then. <laughs> did I don't know I, any I, of that. Did I did I note any of it on your pay on your paper? I think you crossed out over half of my citations because of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I don't mind when people make that mistake because it's better to be over careful than not careful at all. So I'll just normally just cross them out. Um, yeah, it is better to be over careful than not careful at all. So here's the rule. When do you do this? When do you do this? Anytime you change from one source to another, you have to give a citation one of these two ways. So let's say you talk about lamb, lamb source, then you talk about um, Jaeger's source, right? So what in that case, you would have to cite lamb in the sentence or then, then cite Jaeger. But then let's say you go right back to lamb. Well, you then have to cite lamb again, right? However, if you, you let's say you used quotes from lamb three times in a row, well, on the second and third times, you don't have to put the author because it's already clear that you're citing from the same author. If you cite from the same person multiple times in a row, um, you do not have to keep putting the name in. And the same goes for whenever you're writing about your story, whenever you're giving text, textual analysis later. Um, you don't have to um, keep saying Shelley 35, Shelley 92, right? If you keep quoting from Shelley over and over, back to back, you just then put the page number. Sometimes you sometimes you might quote from the same thing back to back, but it has different page numbers. In that case, all you got to do is put the page number. Okay. So anytime you change, you have to cite. That's the rule. Okay. Anytime you change, you got to cite. So you'll probably be doing a lot of citing in this literature review section, because this is where you're summing up the patterns in the scholarship. So, so um, like I said, this is a good, the purpose of the literature review section is to show, is to pretty much establish your ethos. Remember in English 101, right? You had it, logos, ethos, pathos. Ethos is your credibility. Right. And if you show that you understand the larger conversation that's happening around you in that literature review before you get started on your own analysis, you know, that establishes your ethos. That establishes you as a credible person on your topic because you understand the larger conversation that's happening around you. Okay, so if you do this thoroughly and concisely, you're already going to be off to a great start. So again, this is a good place to get most of your sources out of the way. You can then, you, I'm not saying just to confine your sources to this part. Later in the paper, you can bring up your sources if you want. But as you're analyzing the text, but um, like for instance, I know N Nicole, you said that Land's quote was going to be your, Land's article was going to be your counter argument. 
Yeah, yeah. So my thoughts on that were as far as the patterns go, you know, the majority of my sources in support of my argument say the same thing except for a couple parts. So I'm going to try to sum them up in one paragraph and then spend another paragraph on um, what Lamb has to say about it and really about his counter argument. Right. Yeah, so let's say you bring Lamb up on page five though, right? That would be a case where you would cite him. And then let's say you go right back to Shelley again, you would cite him, cite yeah. Shelley, right? Basically, any that's what I'm saying here. You can bring up your sources later in the paper, too. You don't have to just confine them to here. But this is a good place just to show that you understand what you're doing. This paper is really no different from what I'm asking, from what I asked you guys to do in 101, if you think about it. Remember in 101 when we did the classic argument? You know, I said, sum up your sources, sum up the common trends. So what's one side of the ar argument argue? What's the other side of the argument argue? Right? So it's the same concept here, except you're doing it with literature scholarship. All right. So you guys feel clear about citing in the text and all this stuff now? Uh, can you show us the one where, like, if you summarize the uh, gist of the paper for two of your sources, and then you just put both their names, like the name of one and page number, and then comma, the name of another one page number? Yeah, so that that's a case. Okay, that's a case where you would put a comma in the in the bracket. So let's say you'd say land 43, Jaeger 59. All right, so that, let's say you're citing from two sources at once. That's how you would do it. And you might actually do that in your literature review because if you're talking about common trends in the scholarship, then you maybe, as Nicole, as you just said, maybe some of your articles make similar arguments. In which case, you, know, you might cite both in the same sentence. It's a good question, very good question. Does that answer it though? You feel good, Nicole? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I had to step away for one second. But yeah, you summed it up good, thank you. All right. All right, then when we get to the actual paper, so whatever the first reason was back in your thesis, this is where you're gonna start with in the paper. So remember that in a good paragraph, Think about it more in terms of sections of the paper here rather than paragraphs. I don't want, I don't want to confine you just to paragraphs. So you always need a topic sentence that refers back to your thesis. So this helps to keep your paper organized. It helps to keep your paragraphs or sections focused. If you have a topic sentence that always anchors back to the thesis. You have evidence your evidence is quotes from the text. So let's say, for instance, you're arguing about uh, again, like nature versus nurture and Frankenstein, right? So you might have a quote. You might have a quote from the text from Frankenstein here to as your evidence for whatever your claim is. So always, always, always anchor yourself in the text. Don't, don't sum up what's happening in the story. Assume, you're, assume your reader knows what you're talking about. Okay. Assume you read, always assume your reader knows what you're talking about. So you don't have to give so much summary. Just a little bit, maybe a sentence or two to kind of ground the reader. 
but don't go off into writing the whole paragraphs of summary of the story. That's not necessary. But you give your evidence, your quotes from the text, and then you drive home your point. All right. Oftentimes, when I read lit papers, what I see is people will do the first two. They'll give the topic sentence and they'll give the evidence. Oftentimes, I see people don't do the th third point, driving home your point. Don't let a quote speak for itself. Drive home whatever the reason is. So let's say you bring in a quote from Frankenstein, right? Explain to the reader why that quote's significant. Explain to the reader how that quote applies to your argument. Right? So that is what that is what you do in each of your sections. Explain to the reader, give the evidence, but then explain to the reader why the evidence is significant. You don't ever want to let the reader be making guesses about um, why you chose that quote or whatever. You never want the reader to, to guess. You always want, think of the reader like, I mean, know your audience is fairly sophisticated here, but never, never leave the audience guessing in, in an academic paper. I always drive home whatever your point is. Show the significance of the quote to your argument slash prove your argument. Let's say in premise one, you want to bring in one of your quotes and then maybe argue, maybe one of your quotes can be used. So maybe let's say you bring in one of your articles. Well, you could perhaps even like bring in an article to help you prove your point, right? That's something that you can do here. And then just rinse and repeat the further you go. If there's anything I want you guys to learn from my classes, it's writing a good thesis and organizing your work you're writing. If you have, if you have, um, future papers that you write, if you always have a topic sentence, you always have evidence, you always interpret it. If you always do those things and no matter what type of analysis, I don't care what type of analysis it is you're doing, this is how you do it. Topic sentence, evidence, interpretation. Depending on the discipline, the evidence might change uh, you guys see, notice that from one that even 101, right? 101, you wrote about a controversial political topic. 102, you're writing about literature. So whatever discipline it is, the evidence might change. But, the, but that's always what you what you do. Okay. And I'm going to say that the next part is optional. Um, you can add this in if you want. Your paper will probably be better for it. But in a counter argument section, you always want to make, if you do add a section like this, you always want to keep it close to your conclusion. Don't let the counter, don't let the counter argument dominate your paper up front. Introduce the counter argument close to the conclusion. In that case, if you do want to address the counter argument, address it here and then refute it. So you can either show or you can, so if you refute it, you can be like, you can refer back to some of the analysis that you made above. Or like you can even say, well, the counter argument's got, a, I'll admit, the counter argument has a couple of valid points here. However, my argument still, 
you know, holds more weight. All right, so it depends what type of tone you want to take. You know, if you can find it necessary to show, hey, the counter arguments really are on here, take that kind of tone. If you want to say, okay, they do have a few good points, take a more take a diplomatic tone. Right? So that's something that you can do in a counter argument section. I'm making it optional here um, for this paper, you know, just because. For some of you, a counter argument might, might not be as evident. Like some, some of you, it might really uh, speak out. Like if, especially if you're doing an or topic, like nature or nurture and Frankenstein, right? You have a topic like that, you know, addressing a counter argument's pretty easy. And then you conclude. Sum up your argument again. Showcase your arguments, larger significance, and understanding the literary text. Sum up your argument again in, in three or four sentences. Then, sho then showcase to the reader. Why should the reader care about your argument? What's the significance of reading Frankenstein or Dracula in this way? Um, so show the larger significance of your of your argument, whatever whatever it is that you're doing. Again, this is different advice than I give in 101. Um, 101, I said it's not a oftentimes not a good idea to sum up your argument again. Don't assume your reader can't just remember what you just re read in the last few pages. But in the discipline of literature, that's that's the convention. Right, so remember, no matter what literary, no matter what rhetorical context you in, you're in, you always have conventions. All right. So remember PACT, purpose, audience, conventions, trouble spots. Right, literature, the convention is to sum up your argument again. So um, I kind of sketched it out here. And then, of course, after that, after this, you have your work cited. So cite in MLE all of your sources that you used. And the work cited and just Copy and paste over your your citations from your bibliography. That's really all you got to do. Okay, you don't need the annotation with it, but whichever one sources in your bibliography you use, cite them here in MLA. Make sure you cite in alphabetical order. So it starts with A and then goes down to Z on the list. Okay. So you don't have to, if you don't use the source in the paper, you don't have to put them in the work cited. You also, of course, cite whatever primary text you're using. So you would cite Mary Shelley Frankenstein, Bram Stoker Dracula, Shirley Jackson Haunting a Hill House, um, Edgar Allan Poe, The Telltale Heart. All right, whatever whatever story it is that you have in here, make sure that you. Make sure that you cite it here too, in addition to your scholars. So a good work cited will probably have at least four or five, six entries here on the work cited page. And we've already gone over work cited pages, citing an MLA, right? You guys know that if you're using a journal article, you cite like it's a journal article. If you're using a book chapter, you would cite it like it's a book chapter. If it's a page from a website, you use the convention for that. It's all on that Purdue Owl, along with my citation sheet key. So we did the citation activity, it's on the key. So 
So now what questions you guys got? Now that I've explained all this again. I know Kira, this is your first time hearing this. Um, what, yeah. question, what questions you got for me? I'm a little confused about the uh, the literary review section. Okay. So are we, do we have to um, use quotes from our scholarly sources, like all of them? Because I know we're summing up the patterns. So do we have to bring in quotes that correlate with each other from each source? You don't necessarily have to use quotes. Um, you can paraphrase. So uh, you can okay. paraphrase, you can paraphrase their argument and then cite it. But if you find that there's a really juicy quote you want to throw in to show what one of your sources argued, then by all means, throw a quote in there. But even if you paraphrase, you still got a cite. So. I'm kind of more like summarizing what, I'm not really paraphrasing, I'm kind of just pretty much saying what all of, what most of them is about, because they're pretty much all arguing the same thing you know so how would i put or how would i stop that so like i said if you cite from maybe the same source twice from two different sources you would do it this way both authors say this and then like let's say you're citing from two authors at once that's how you would do it um, but it's not like an actual quote. So would I still, but I would still do like the parentheses and put the author. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. So if you're paraphrasing, right? If you're paraphrasing, let's say, Lamb's argument in your own words, like you're explaining what he argued, right? You don't have to have a quote, quote mark, but then you would still put the page, the, the tag at the end for page number. So do I need to do that with every source that, I, that I'm using? Like the gist of this person's argument is this, and the gist of this person's argument is this. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, that's that's exactly what you do here. And if two people's art or two or three people's arguments from your sources are really really similar, you can say uh, X Y Z's argument amounts to blank, and then you would put the names and the page numbers in the quotes, or not the quotes, but the parentheses. Well, you repeat sure. that, Tom. Uh, if like you have multiple sources that are pretty much saying the same thing, you can say Lamb, Jaeger, and so-and-so, so-and-so's arguments amount to blank just like you know the gist of lamb's argument is blank and then in the quotations you would just put the page numbers for each of those uh so, uh sources yeah that's right nicole okay thank you and she's so she pretty much just asked another question about citing more than one author at once uh, you could also Jaeger and Lamb's argument. So we'll just say the gist of Jaeger and Lamb's argument is blank. If we're still paraphrasing, I mean, I'm actually moving this down to paraphrasing. So in this case, let's say that you quoted from Jaeger first. So 
So which, whichever one that you use first, you would put, then put the page number for. To avoid confusion, to avoid confusion for that, um, if you have a case like this, I'll make one exception to the rule. If you're quoting from two authors at once, it'll it's okay to use the name twice in the sentence and then the tag, but only if you use more than two. Okay. I'll make an exception in that case. That's that'll I'd say that's probably be such a rare case. I don't I doubt even you guys would even do that. And if in case you did, I wouldn't be fine if you put the whole tag in in addition to the sentence. So anytime, so anytime you paraphrase, make sure you cite. Um, if you don't, if you don't, even even if you're just putting somebody else's argument in your own words, you do have to cite it. So you feel better now, Kira? Does that answer some of your questions? Yeah, it does. Thank good. you. Good, good. Yes, I still need to get you guys some examples. Um, I'll need to dig through my archives and find you guys a couple of relevant examples here. I'll probably have something on. I don't. I don't know if nobody's ever done research on Frankenstein or anything for me before. I probably got some stuff on like yellow wallpaper or Hawthorne or something like that. I can get you. So I'll actually, I will dig through my archives and come up with some examples I can send send out to you. If I forget to do that, remind me in the next couple of days. You guys know how scatterbrained I am. And so if I do forget to do that, just be like, hey, send, shoot us some examples. And I'll do it. Um, trying to keep up with like 10 different classes at once. That's what happens. You get scatterbrained. Anything else you guys want to talk about today? You want me to go over like comma splices and run-ons and stuff like that again? And I guess what? Well, I have a, I have a question about like during the body paragraphs. Uh, do we need to bring in? Because uh, I remember asking you th about this, and you kind of said that during that paper paper that we are just getting our evidence from like the stories we're using to back up our, you know, things. But do I need to bring in some sources too and and stuff during like the body paragraphs? Yeah, you can do that. So I'm, I, was, I think I said earlier, if you bring in your sources in the body paragraphs, use them to help you drive home whatever point you're making. So let's say let's say you're making a point, then you can be like, Lamb's article makes a similar or Lamb makes a similar point to me here. Right? So you can actually use your sources to back you up. Um, in addition to your textual evidence, so that's not you don't have to keep bringing them up or using them, but if you find that hey, you want to use them to help you prove your point use them. You don't have to confine your sources just to the lit review section. So I'm, what I'm saying here is if you want to, that's, that's basically what I'm saying here, Kira. Okay. They can never really hurt unless, unless you're bringing in somebody to disprove your argument, right? So then that could hurt, but it, doesn't hurt to bring them up here and there. So, so, so many of the answers I give you guys is a maybe, right? Maybe if you, if, you, if you find it necessary, more than a definite yes or no. So you feel better about that or did I just complicate things more? No, I feel better about it. Okay, good. 
You're asking good questions. I always appreciate when we get good questions. Don't don't overthink the lit review. All right, it's, it's real simple. Just sum up what the people are saying, and then say it, and then show what you're adding to the conversation. It might not, your idea might not be the most original of ideas, right? But you can at least show, hey, I'm adding a new voice to this conversation. It's already that's been ongoing for decades. I feel like I'm the biggest overthinker when it comes to your papers. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Sometimes it's better to overthink than underthink, right? That's, that's my that's my mantra. Better to overdo things than underdo them. Ryan, how are you feeling about all this? You've been you've been relatively silent over there. Feeling fine, just trying to do a lot more work. You got like three papers to do before this one, so like <laughs> so this paper is the last thing on your mind at the moment. Lauren, you feeling good? Yeah, I'm just curious. What's a comma splice or whatever you said a minute ago? Okay. I've never heard of that before. I've only heard of it in this class. <laughs> this is the example I always use when I when I cover this. If you have two sentences, you can't just put a comma in between them. A comma is not sufficient punctuation to separate two completely different sentences. That's what a comma splice is. You can't, you can't just have a comma separating two sentences. Um, so what are some ways that we can make this correct? So let me just add to the notes wrong. Comma can't separate two sentences. What are some ways we can make it right? Well, we can add a conjunction. So we can Therefore. say, you know, we can use and, but, or, for, nor, or let's say that we're using a semicolon then we can use a word like therefore or a word like however or a word like furthermore. That's another way that you can do it. And each one of the conjunctions changes the tone and the implications of the sentence a little bit. Right, so if I say so here, right, and that, and that suggests that there's a relationship between teaching and balding. Right? Because I'm a teacher, I must be bald. But yet, well, that insinuates most teachers have nice heads of hair, and I'm the exception of the rule. Um, so that's that's what a commas place is. You can't you can't just separate two sentences with just a comma. That's by far the most frequent grammatical mistake that you can make. Um, like, it's, it's the comma splices of the bane of English teacher's existence. You can't just separate two sentences with a comma. Another example, another common issue is a run on. Run-ons when you have nothing separating the two. You don't even have a comma. No punctuation separates the two. That's what a run-on is. So 
So if I've marked com splice on any of your papers, Lauren, that's that's what I meant. I don't know. If, I don't know if I did or not. I don't think you have. I just didn't know what you were meaning whenever you said it a minute ago. Yeah, and avoid doing those in the papers. Like I said, this is the bane. This is the bane of our existence. Um, anytime we see them, we a little piece of our soul dies. So, like, make sure make sure that you make sure you keep me on the right path. All right? Make sure make sure you don't kill my soul by putting too many comma splices in here. Maybe. As you can learn from Faustus, Doctor Yeager, you're always able to repent. Right, even the midnight hour. Right. 11.45, I still have a chance. So one last error I wanted to talk about, the sentence fragment. I have been noticing a lot of these popping up lately. Sentence fragment. Sentence fragments when you don't have both a subject and verb in the sentence. Oftentimes people will make these sentence fragments by starting a sentence with an ing word. So grabbing the cupcakes, right? That's not a sentence, grabbing the cupcakes, period. That's not a sentence. Uh, that's the that's the predicate of the sentence, but that's not a complete sentence. So if we were going to fix that, we would have to say, Jeff grabbed the cupcakes. Right. So you would need a you would need a subject and a verb here. To fix that, could you also like okay, so grabbing the cupcakes, comma, Jeff went out the door. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a way you could you can make that an initial phrase if you want to. All right. But I do notice when students use do these, oftentimes they'll start with these ing verbs. I don't like ing verbs at all. I hate ing verbs. Normally, ing verbs come with a linking verb. So I am going to the store, right? So it's better writing to always use the action verb. So I went to the store, right? And rather than saying I'm going to the store, I went to the store. Now, even though like using ing verbs without the um uh shoot i can't remember the flipping word without anything before it like if you were to use it as a uh initial phrase and then have the rest of it and it be a full sentence would that like speed up the pace of your sentences a bit sure it's all i mean it's always good to have different syntax mixing it up right so like if you have an initial phrase like this I mean, any, anytime you mix up the syntax, it's always a good thing. But that would be more for creative writing, I think, because syntax isn't nearly as important in like a uh, educational piece or a research topic or argumentative paper as it is in something that you're really trying to get your reader absorbed into. That's right. Yeah. Academic writing is boring, right? And we, li we like it that way. So... Um, so if you're writing a narrative or something like that, that's that's when you might mix it up a little more. The one thing I will the one thing I will say, I forgot to mention this, but anytime you talk about literature, you're supposed to keep your verbs in the present tense. So let's say you're talking about Frankenstein, um, then maybe you're talking about the part where he reads Paradise, but the creature reads Paradise Lost. So uh, if, if you were writing in your body of your paper, um, you would write that in the present tense. So the creature reads Paradise Lost in this scene. Um, 
you don't use the past tense in whenever you're talking about literature. You're supposed to use the present tense. So uh, just a heads up. If you do use the past tense, I I'm, I'm probably won't ding you on it or whatever. The main thing that you need to do, you guys need to do though, is keep a consistent tense through the paper. If you use a either use a consistent present or a consistent past. Don't change tenses five times in a paragraph. Um, that's a tense shift. Keep a consistent tense, ideally present. So instead of saying grad, the present tense would be grads. And That's something I that's something I I sometimes do when I write about literature. Like I'll sometimes tense shift or use past when I should use present and all that stuff. But if, if you're that, speaking if I, about something, or go ahead. Sorry, go on. No, you go ahead. I was just gonna I was just gonna say if you're speaking about something, especially if it's like in regards to literature in the past sense, that makes it feel almost like you're uh ah, shoot what's the word uh i'm totally blanking right now we literally just talked about it when you're uh summarizing like talking about it in past tense is more like you're summarizing it than analyzing it right yeah that that's, that's probably why that's the convention you know to use the present instead of the past and whenever talking about literature, I've never really thought much about why that is the convention, but that makes sense. Like I said, what? Or, I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. If we're talking about, like, if I'm talking about the yellow wallpaper and I'm talking about something that happened to the narrator or like something that her husband did, how would I word that to be present tense and not past tense? So let's say you're, you're quoting from the yellow wallpaper. Um, you would just, in that case, you would just use the present tense whenever you're, whenever you have the verbs. So he does this instead of he yeah. did this. Right. John, John, the husband, say, says this, quote, right? Instead of said, says. You just, you just kind of got to be mindful to always remember to use your present tense when, when, when talking about the lit. Now, in another paragraph where you're, maybe you're summing up the scholars or whatever, well, even 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 in your lit review, you should use present tense. John Lamb says this, right, rather than said. It gives a, it gives your writing the feeling of being more um, present and also being more. Um, shoot, I'm having like a brain fart day. I swear. Uh, I can't think of the word, but being more valid to like today, I guess you could say, I don't know. Y'all probably know the word I'm trying to think of. I cannot think of it. All right, more active, perhaps. It's more engaging to keep it on present, I would say. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. More engaging. So we're close to the end. Um, any other questions I can answer? All right, so yeah, that was a lot. We talked about the paper and we talked about, we refreshed ourselves on some grammar stuff. So uh, and those are by far the most common mistakes people make. I summed them up in 10 minutes, so. It just, it just goes to show you that 
the teaching of English in K in K to twelve is sometimes faulty. They teach you how to do commas for twelve years, and I just did it in ten minutes. All right, so <laughs> it really me a lot. I try to beat grammar into my head for so long, and I never soaked up any of it. And now all of a sudden, I'm in this college course, and I'm learning so much new information that is so old that people have tried to teach me for years. It's crazy. All right. Now all those all those worksheets you did about how to use commas, right? Didn't didn't teach you anything. It was so I honestly don't think I've been taught grammar since about sixth grade. I think they need to reassess the whole organization of the way they teach English in West Virginia. Like me and Lauren were talking about this. If they did grammar, mainly focused on grammar and like the um, mechanics of writing in your freshman and sophomore years, and then your junior and senior year, they focused on applying that into writing and also literature. Students would have a, a way better foundation in English than they do now. I agree. And also the amount of like, grammar and stuff like that that's on SAT, ACT. That stuff's important for getting into college and this and that and the other. That's pretty much a, the majority that's on it and you don't know anything. Like if I took the SAT, ACT now, I feel like my scores would be so much better just because how it's taught, it's being taught to me. Right. It would be an interesting experiment to go back and take an ACT English or whatever again after your first year just to see how much better you do. Well, good. Um, so the next time we will meet will be Tuesday a week from now. Thurs this Thursday is a just consider it a writing day, right? So Consider this Thursday a writing day. Next Tuesday, we'll meet for the peer review. So remember to get me the paper, ideally the day before, but if you procrastinate, at least by noon, the day of our peer review. That way I can forward it. That way you guys can take a peek and be ready to do some critiques. So for Tuesday, is it like the full paper or is it still just only a draft? And by then, it should be the full paper. Okay, I was just making sure. I was going to do a full paper. Yeah, it should be the full paper by next, because I think the things do like next Wednesday or something. So you will be doing the peer review the day before you turn it in. Okay. All right, so we'll see you guys then. Let me know if you have questions, if you want me to read over something early or something like that. All right.